Good morning. I invite you today to take your Bible and turn to Acts chapter 3. The book of Acts chapter 3. Find verse 1. Book of Acts chapter 3 and verse 1. I'm in a series of messages that I'm calling, You Can't Stop This. And last Sunday morning we preached, You Cannot Stop a Spirit-Filled Church. And today I want to share with you, You Cannot Stop a Spirit-Filled Believer. You can't stop this. Let me read Acts chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a certain man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. And Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze upon him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have... I give to you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up. And immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And with a leap he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he was clinging to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon, full of amazement. Let's bow and ask the Lord to speak to us today. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to share this message, this truth. I pray for those, Father, who will listen and hear this, your word today. I pray, Father, that the truths that they hear will find their way into their hearts. And that, Father, it will forever change how they view themselves and how they view ministry. Father, let us see that indeed you cannot stop a spirit-filled believer. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. What do I do with the person that came to my door last evening around 6 p.m. needing a place to stay for the night? That person has come to my door many times before. What do I do with him What do I do with the individual who knocks on my door on a Monday afternoon at 5.30 and he's hungry? He hasn't had anything to eat all day. What do I do with him? What do I do with the one who comes to me while I am pumping gas at Brookshire's and asks if I could buy them some gas for a trip they need to take to the doctor's office that afternoon? What do I do? What do you do with the needs in the lives of people that you are confronted with on a regular basis? What do you do with the hurting people, the helpless people that you encounter? Or do you even cross paths with such kind of of people? Maybe you do, but you just walk right past them, ignoring the need and pretending you don't see them. You don't want to take the time to deal with them. These verses that I read this morning in our text have helped me in obtaining answers to my questions. These verses have opened my eyes to some things that I'm doing right and some things that I'm doing wrong. Before I get to that, though, I want us to walk our way through this story, for it is indeed a a beautiful story. 
I, I want you to see this story because it really is a, a great story. It is the first recorded miracle in the book of Acts. I want us to look at it in its historical setting. And then I'll share with you what the Lord and I have been talking about. I'll share with you what the Lord has shown me out of this text. Verse 1 says that it was the ninth hour that Peter and John were going up to the temple to pray. The ninth hour is 3 p.m. It was a time that the evening sacrifice was offered and it was also observed as an hour of prayer. For you see, the Christians continued to worship in the temple after Jesus' resurrection. They were thought of as persons who, although they obtained fanatical ideas about the Messiah, although they entertained wild ideas about who the Messiah was, according to the rest of the Jews, they were still adherents to Judaism. So at the regular hour of worship, Peter and John are going up. It's the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. And every day a certain lame man was laid outside the temple. He was forbidden from entering the temple to worship. Leviticus chapter 21 tells us that, that no lame man was allowed inside the temple to worship. So this man was not allowed in the temple. He was laid outside the temple at a gate that is called beautiful. This man was habitually carried to the temple every day and sat down to beg along with probably a dozen or so other beggars, each seeking to catch the attention of those who came to worship that day. The Bible says that he was lame. Now, that is a particular medical term that means he was paralyzed in his ankles and in his heels. If you remember, the writer of the book of Acts is Luke. And if you remember Luke's profession, Luke was a doctor. Luke was a, a physician. And so he gives us the technical term, translated lame, paralysis in the ankles or, or heels, thus making it impossible for this man to walk. And this had been his condition since birth. He was now more than 40 years old. Acts chapter 4 is going to tell us that. For 40 plus years he has been this way. Let me give you something to think about. Why didn't Jesus heal this man? You see, he's been here every day probably for 40 plus years and... Jesus probably saw this man in and out of his trips to the temple. Jesus had probably passed him on his way, but, but he never healed him. Why had this man not been healed by Jesus? I, I think Jesus, if he indeed did pass him, see him, said to himself, His miracle is coming. His miracle is coming. I, I think every time he passed that man laying there outside the temple that he just maybe kind of said to himself, Buddy, buddy, you just wait. Your healing is coming one day. God's timing, not yet. God's timing is not yet. But buddy, your healing's coming one day. Now some of you here today needed to hear just that word that it's not God's timing yet the lame man is outside the gate at the temple and Peter and John come by and he begins begging repeatedly that's the idea he begins asking repeatedly and Peter looks at him straight in the eye the crowds are passing by the crowds are going by the crowds are ignoring him walking by but Peter looks him straight in the eye and says look at us and the man gave Peter and John his attention expecting to receive money from them and maybe even a little more money than usual because Peter had spoken to him. Peter had acknowledged him. Peter hadn't just walked by and emptied a few coins out of his pockets down at the feet of, the, of this man. No, Peter had actually stopped and acknowledged him. And so this man gives Peter and John his full attention, maybe expecting to receive more than usual. And then Peter does two things. The first thing he does is he admits he's broke. <laughs> I, I don't possess silver and gold. I know that's what you're looking for from me, but but I do not have silver or gold. I can't help you there. 
And then Peter says, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. And at that moment, strength comes flowing into his ankles. Peter takes him by the right hand and begins to pick him up. And again, here in verse 7, these are medical terms. The word feet there in verse 7 is a word that means the base of his foot or heel. The word ankles there is a word that means his ankles were out of socket. The bones in his heel were out of place. The ankles were out of socket. And all of a sudden, those things begin to come together. All of a sudden, his heel bones were healed and his ankles were re-socketed. <laughs> How, how's that for medical terminology? Re-socketed. No, Luke, the physician, has given us the medical terms for that. And at that moment, heels and ankles become strong. And the man is able to walk again. And, and, and what does one do who is able to walk for the first time ever? You leap. You walk around. You jump. You begin to praise God. And you enter the temple for the first time in your life. For the first time in his life, this man enters the temple. Someone has said, no longer does the church have to say, silver and gold have I none. But no longer can it say, in the name of Jesus Christ, walk. We've traded Riches for power. We, we've traded wealth for the anointing of the Spirit. No longer does the church have to say, silver and gold, I don't have any. It's not true anymore. But neither can it say, in the name of Jesus, walk. And, and while that prayer meeting is going on inside the temple, a crowd is gathering outside the temple. The beggar who was always here, we saw him leap. We saw him walk. We saw him jump around. He danced his way into the temple. The disciples of the crucified one, Jesus of Nazareth, used his name to heal this man. And a great crowd forms on the portico of Solomon waiting for Peter and John to return. Now the prayer service would have lasted one hour. Think about what Peter learned in that hour that he spent praying in the temple. Having just healed that lame man in the power of Jesus Christ. Think about what Peter prayed about. Talked to the Lord and heard from the Lord about. I, I, think, I think Peter learned that one lost sheep is just as important as the 3,000 that were saved at Pentecost. I think Peter heard again the words of Jesus. I think Peter was reminded again of the words of Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. I think Peter also was reminded of the words of Jesus in John chapter 16 and verse 7. But I tell you the truth, it is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And here is what Peter learned in that hour prayer meeting. And it's our life point this morning. This is what you and I need to learn as well this morning. The Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. The Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. Peter realized that when Jesus was on earth, his work was contained to wherever he was at the moment. 
But now that the Spirit is in us, now that the Spirit is in you, Jesus' power is wherever any believer finds himself. Thus the extent of our works, which Jesus does through us by the power of the Spirit, is greater than anything he ever accomplished while on earth. Peter saw that Jesus himself was still at work doing exactly what he had done in the days of his flesh. Peter and John were no longer isolated disciples. They were members of Christ's body, to use the New Testament language. They were members of Christ's body. They were living members of the living Christ, and therefore instruments of his will and his power. And it was Jesus who healed this man through Peter. When Peter reached down and grabbed a hold of that man's right hand, it was Jesus making contact with a human need through a member of his body. The Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. And I want you and I to have that perspective. I want you to see your ministry, I want you to see our ministry as an extension of Jesus' works, not something that we do for Jesus. Because you see, for years I thought that ministry was something I do for Jesus. No. Ministry is Jesus doing His work through me. Ministry is not something you do for Jesus. Ministry is Jesus doing His work through you, a member of His body. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 begins this way. It begins with these words. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. The first account I composed, O Theophilus, this is Luke writing. And the first account is his gospel, the gospel of Luke. And here in the book of Acts, Luke says, Theophilus, the, the gentleman that he was writing to, Theophilus, I composed that first account to tell you all that Jesus began to do and teach. And now I'm going to write an account of all that Jesus continues to do and teach through his body, his followers, his disciples. And so ministry is not something that we do for Jesus. Ministry is something that Jesus does through us. The book of Acts recounts what Jesus continues to do. No longer through his incarnated body, but by his spirit in his church through you and me. In other words, Jesus... It, it, it's not that Jesus worked while he was here and now we are his church working in his absence. No, no, no. Jesus worked then through his physical incarnation and he works now through his church. You and me, same Jesus, still at work. Same Jesus, still saving. He is just as much at work through you in Mount Vernon right now as he was back then in the streets of Jerusalem. The Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. Now back to that person at my back door. What, what do I do with him? I want you to notice what Peter did. Peter did not offer him the goods with which to continue his old life. He offered him the means by which to begin a new life. Peter didn't offer him the stuff, silver and gold, to just continue his old way of life. If Peter had dropped on him a few coins that day, that man would have been right back out there the next day begging. Peter did not offer him the goods which with to continue his old life. No, Peter offered him the means to which he could begin a new life. 
That's what the church has to do. Peter said to him, I have nothing to give you that will help you maintain your life while you are a cripple, but I have something to cure the crippled condition you are in. You can stop begging and start living. And dear family, that's Christianity. That's Christianity. Christianity comes to give men life and put them on their feet. I'll be honest with you. I would, I would rather give the person a night stay, give the person the tank of gas, and send them on their way than pray with them one hour and meet their deepest need. I, I'd rather give them the night stay just to get them out of my driveway than pray with them for one hour and try to discover and meet their deepest need. And, and then it dawned on me. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the government. <laughs> because you see, the government solution to this man's problem was just was, was, was more money. The government gives alms. The government gives money. Because that's all it can give. That's all the government has. The church's solution has to be different. The church's solution is different. The business of the church is not only to help people maintain their crippled condition. The business of the church, dare I say, the work of Jesus through his church is to find men and women who are lying at the gate, excluded from the life of God, and put them on their feet, making them worshipers. That's what we are called to do. We are called to release the life of God. We are called to declare the power of God and make available to men and women in the name of Jesus the things that only God can do for them. Because lame humanity is the church's opportunity. That's where we have to be. Lame humanity, outside the gate, excluded, those that cannot get in. That is our place. That is our opportunity. So may the fire of the Holy Spirit kindle in us a warmth and affection for others. And may the wind of the Holy Spirit pick us up and carry us to people in need. What is our mission? It is to speak and work in the name of Jesus. It is to be the body of Jesus in Mount Vernon. It is to be the hands and feet of Jesus, His body, going to others in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. The church that comes to the wounded, the church that comes to the weary and the crippled and the fallen and holds out its right hand and lifts. That is the church through which Jesus will do His work and that is the church that will turn this town upside down for Jesus. Let me say one more thing about this and then we'll get to some take-home truths. I thought about this also. Even if abortion was outlawed and homosexual marriage was declared illegal, unconstitutional, even if abortion was outlawed and homosexual marriage was declared unconstitutional and the borders were sealed and the flow of Ill illegal immigrants was stopped and even if minimum wage was raised to 10 or $15 an hour and millions more dollars were pumped into our nation's inner cities, even if all of that was done, people would still be dying and going to hell. We need to be careful about which kingdom we're building. We need to make sure we're building the right kingdom. Okay, take home truths. There's three of them. If you would simply remember these, these three things. Number one is this. Recover the concept that the church is a movement driven by the Spirit, not a place to go and sit. 
Jesus started a worldwide revolution and we are to continue it. Jesus said that the gates of hell will not stop his church. You can't stop this. You can't stop a spirit-filled believer. Those first believers understood the church was a movement. Because it was birthed by a mighty rushing wind of the Spirit of God. And those filled with the Spirit move out. Is that how you see church? By and large, we've gone from a movement to a place. From a channel of God's mighty Spirit to a place where we go and sit. How did that happen? Most people today see the church as an institution. Or a place to go. Or something to sit through. They think of church as a place, not a movement. And by and large, people are raised to go to church and not be the church. We've got to recover the concept that we need to be the church. That the church is a place, not a place. It's a movement driven by the Spirit, not a place to go and sit. Second thing is this. Those filled with the Spirit move. They move into the streets. They they go in the Spirit's power. And so we must go because we are living members of the living Christ. And we must move in the Spirit's power to the streets outside of here. You can't stop Spirit-filled believers. In every age, we face the danger of degrading ourselves from a movement to a place. But the Spirit is a mighty rushing wind and those filled with the Spirit move. Where there is no movement, there is no spirit. And then thirdly, be ready for any opportunity for ministry that Jesus may put in your path. Be ready for any opportunity for ministry that Jesus may put in your path. That's the work He wants to do through you those opportunities that you find in your path. Ministry is not something you do for Jesus. Would you remember that I said that? Would you remember that truth? Ministry is not something you do for Jesus. It's Jesus doing His work through you. Don't be afraid to speak boldly in the name of Jesus. Don't be hesitant to use the gifts that the Spirit has given to you to minister to others. Let the Spirit send you to people in need. Be involved in ministry. The works Jesus wants you to accomplish here through you. Do you really believe we can do greater works than Jesus? Do I really believe we will see greater works than Jesus? Absolutely. Absolutely. Leading someone to find forgiveness of sins is a greater work than making a lame man walk. Because one is temporary and the other is eternal. Jesus can only be in one place. Jesus could only be in one place and at one time. And you and I can be all over this community at the same time meeting the physical and spiritual needs of others. We can be like little Christs all over this community, in the school and on the job and in the shop and at the office and in our neighborhood. We can be like little Christs going here and going there. Little Christ ministering in the name of Jesus. Little Christ. There ought to be a word for that. Oh, oh, there is. Christian. The Spirit inside you is better than Jesus beside you. Let's pray. Father, thank you today for the truth of your word. I pray, Father, that it will have lodged itself in the hearts and minds of people who listen to this. and We we can recover the concept that the church is a movement, Father. 
not a place to come and sit. And that those filled with the Spirit move. And we have to be ready for the opportunities that you place in our path. So, Father, let us be the church that you desire us to be in this community. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.